So thank you uh, for being here tonight. So I'm Alexi Agayi. I'm the CTO and co-founder of uh, Hypolex. And I'm going to present you uh, what we do um, with machine learning applied to legal practice. So what is Hypolex? Uh, we are a startup um, doing contract management and also contract analysis, data extraction, and review of the contract. Uh, what does it mean? Um, let's start with a use case. Um, let's say I'm a legal expert and I would like to find companies in charge of investment portfolio. Uh, if I am a human and if I have contract printed on paper, uh, what I will do is to look for the proper papers, uh, find uh, <coughs> probably a stack of, uh, of files of papers and um, search into those papers to find a document related to investment and then quickly browse on the, those documents to search for a related paragraph speaking of investment and then briefly read the sentence where uh, I could spot the company name and, identif and identify those um, company names. So as a human I will do all those tasks and it's pretty, pretty um, um, long and um, fastidious. Uh, so what we are trying to do is to automate all those stages and use uh, machine learning to, um, to learn from the document and uh, avoid you all those steps, especially if you have to deal with, let's say, more than thousands of documents. So what we have is a machine learning pipeline. Um, it's pretty, uh, pretty heavy. Uh, I would say just not one, one step. There. That's why I wanted to show you that, because it's not just a single silver bullet. There are many stages, many stuff we do in, uh, in our, in our uh, machine learning uh, pipeline. So quickly and briefly, um, we have a first step, uh, which is um, OCR, uh, optical character recognition, uh, which is not done by ourselves. We use a, a third party uh, software. But uh, right after, we have to clean the text uh, in case of, of having, for example, glyphs uh, in, the, in the OCR output, and also do paragraph segmentation. What I say paragraph segmentation is, for example, here, identify that this is a paragraph, and also, identify that there is a column here and the reading flow is in that direction and then it comes back here, etc. And also we are going to clean the text and remove probably tables or maybe watermark here. So it's pretty, pretty complicated to do, but it's really, really important to do if you want to have a cool and uh, very clean um, input for the next stages. So the next stages is what we call a document classification. I'm going to have a brief uh, slide on that. Then again, paragraph classification and then um, name entity recognition. So this name entity recognition is, um, is uh, trying to find the company, to spot the company name here in, uh, in uh, for example, a sentence. And Based on the entity name recognition, we also do what we call hierarchical data recomposition, meaning that, for example, if this is a company and if there is, for example, an address related to that company, we will build um, a tree uh, of dependencies between, between the entity we have extracted. And finally, on the next stage, we also do what we call natural language inference. So we try to see if, for example, uh, this paragraph means something. Uh, I will also explain it later. So let's go back to a simple case and I'm going to try to explain you through, um, quite briefly how machine learning works and uh, the evolution of machine learning cr across this example. So let's say we, have, we want to do named entity recognition. So we have a, symbol, a sim simple phrase, a simple sentence here. And we want to extract Serena uh, as an organization. So here we can see that there are some words and uh, between on the left and right side of Serena there are the word by and SIS. So quite, uh, quite simply as a human, uh, if I'm reading this document and I, will, I would probably say that if I spot SIS, uh, which is in French, uh, Société, uh, <laughs> uh, sorry, <laughs> I, well, exactly. <laughs> it's probably the word before SIS is a company. And by also, we could expect that the next word after by is probably a a company, but here we can say that's kind of uh, weak. But okay, if we have the comp the the two case for, for example, if we have buy here before and probably SIS after, the word in the middle will probably be an organization. So this is what we call uh, features. We we have some kind of recipe like that, and we know that uh, if, for example, the first letter is capital, it means that probably it will be an organization. So there is a lots of 
features like that, and we can uh, try to use them to build what we call a feature representation of uh, this and put it into what we call a learning function and that will try to learn from the features that uh, uh, according to what we give in input, uh, the output should be organization. Generally, in a classical machine learning, it's what we call a linear classifier, so it tries to separate the space from, for example, what would be organization and what are not organization. So this is what what was what well, but this is why I call it traditional because that was used in the let's say uh, before in the early two uh, thousands uh, and maybe before. What has changed um, is that now, for well, now, because uh, deep learning, the concept <laughs> of deep learning, quite also those let's say. In the end of the previous century, what, we, what, what has been introduced is the deep learning and it's the idea of having, instead of having human trying to find the feature representation here, we let uh, what we call a learning function extract those features uh, from, uh, from the world. So learn from the word here, uh, well, it's not working anymore, here, from the word here, that uh, probably by an SIS uh, means that in between uh, Serena is uh, an organization. And we have many layers like that of what we call a, ne a neural network. And it tries to, across those, all those functions, uh, tries to learn based on what we call a loss function, so the, the difference between what we should have and what we output it. Uh, learn uh, and that it is an organization. If it's not the case, it will back propagate into the different layers and, uh, at, and fine tune the function in order to to have what we call um, the gradient at the minimum uh, level um, to reach uh, what we want, meaning that we want to have an organization as an output. I'm not uh, entering into the details here, it's more uh, machine learning uh, stuff and you could have details on, on, the, on the papers, but the principle is here. So we give inputs and based on a huge numbers of inputs, let's say uh, thousands of example, this function will converge uh, to a stabilization point uh, that will probably output most of the time, even 100% even, even time, it's never 100%, but close to 100%, organization as an output. So what has changed? In 2014, um, an engineer from Google called uh, Mikolov introduced what, uh, what is well known now as a word to vec So the word to vec is the uh, idea of uh, having a um, word represented as a vectors. And uh, as, I, as I told you here previously, here we have words as an input. And it's quite difficult to represent a word in a, in a, in a in a mathematical way uh, as a vector and uh, what has been tried what has Mikolov tried to do is to extract a vector from a word so the principle is to use all the data set all the um, corpus of text we have in the word to train a very simple uh, one single layer network to uh, recognize and to, um, to, to produce a vector from a word. So the principle is that, let's say here you have a word, palace, uh, the palace at Versailles, house at King of France, etc. And let's say you have a word Versailles, so you take a window between those words, uh, the, between uh, before and after Versailles, and you realize that generally Versailles is close to the word palace, and generally King also is close to Versailles. Also, King is close to Versailles and France, etc. So if you pass um, billions of sentences and where they are Versailles, you will probably see that Versailles is close to words like that. And it will produce a vector of high dimension space, probably a vector of more than, uh, not probably, it could, depending on the tuning you want, but with more than 100 uh, dimension. And this is quite uh, efficient because it has a very good uh, result. As you can see, for example, here, uh, the vector, so using these techniques, the vectors of, uh, let's say, uh, uh, man, for example, the translation between man and woman is quite the same as the translation between queen and uh, king and queen. And here, for example, Spain and Madrid, Italy and Rome, so the capital and uh, the country. So it has proven that it has a quite good representation on most of the world. And it, uh, it has been very, really interesting because now we have a vector and we can use it as an input for all our um, natural language processing um, <coughs> stages. So go back to, uh, to the um, entity recognition. Uh, let's say now we have a vector. 
And uh, let's say we want to use a uh, neural network uh, to uh, infer, to predict that Serena is an organization. So we use the vector representation we had from the uh, extracted from the word to vec and we inject it into a multi-layer. So here I, I just summarize quickly the, the network here into a multi-layer network and it will try to infer that uh, if we have those three words here, by the word in the middle will probably not be uh, an organization and uh, Serena next uh, word uh, with a sliding window will be an organization. Um, this worked pretty well but it, it, some improvement have been realized and let's say that it could be interesting to to do differently. So let's say we want to to take account of the context and uh, if I take these sentences Investment is probably very meaningful for uh, identifying Serena as a, as a company. So here the idea is to inject uh, to the network as an input the output of the previous word uh, 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 that has been processed by the layers. So here by is uh, processed and we can say it's not organization, but also it's, uh, the output is used as an input of the next word. And by doing so we can um, we can just take account of the context, so we can just use the previous word, etc., from the sentence, and use it as a as a way to capture the the uh, some some f some stuff from the from the phrase. So investment, for example, here we will be cat, but also the verb will be will be also. Um, we have an impact and by also we have an impact and we know that those words does not really uh, give any meanings to what we are trying to do. So here again there are some tuning that were called for example uh, LSTM which is a long short term memory uh, neural network that try to to, 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 to just uh, take account of the, the words that are meaningful and cut the words that are not meaningful. So try to memorize and get the context uh, and put some weight on important words and just uh, bypass the words that are not meaningful. And one last tuning is to do it bidirectionally. So again here, funny thing is that you can just say investment is important for having this extracted as an organization, but if you take it backward and uh, read the sentence in that direction, probably, but here is not the case, maybe this word would be important to determine that Serena is an organization. So doing backwards also helps to uh, have an, an, an idea of what the, what, what the word means. Okay, now if you want to, so we have a method to just um, uh, extract words and if you want also to have a vector representation of paragraphs and even document, there are some techniques. So briefly, uh, one way is to use what we call a bag of words, which is quite naive. We take words, for example, uh, we don't take account of the, um, of the orders and we just do a mathematical, for example, uh, uh, function, let's say, uh, summarize uh, or average, and we have a words uh, a vector representing the meaning somehow of the of the sentence uh, based on the word vector we have. Of course, it's not very efficient because it does not take account of the um, words um, orders. So we can also use a bag of n-grams. So we take uh, n words and try to take account of the of the order of the word. And one other way to do it is also to use a method quite similar to a word vect, is the doc vect. So it tries to infer a word, we try to uh, find a word based on the paragraph and the word it is composed. And we train a network uh, to recognize what would be the word according to what we have in the paragraph. And by doing so, we can extract a vector from the paragraph. So this is very interesting, but uh, you realize that uh, it's mostly uh, depends really, really hard on the word representation. And as, as, uh, as I said, uh, for example, it works well for Versailles, for example, but if you take the word, uh, let's say, um, that has uh, many meanings, for example, uh, I don't know, running, for example, running could mean someone running, but it's also something happening. I don't know if it's uh, <laughs> not very good in English, but you can imagine that there are words that have many meanings. and. Uh, here, uh, we have one vector representing this word, so it could bring some confusion, and it's not very, not what we want, especially if we have, a <clears throat> if you are working on very specific legal document, and it, sometimes we, it was funny because we realized that uh, running in, Fran in French meaning courir has two meanings. Uh, we can say uh, le, 
le document, enfin la, la date limite court jusqu'à, so meaning that uh, it will um, be uh, efficient until a special date. And for um, what we know, running is more uh, interpreted as someone running. So, so, so it's, it has not, it was not a good meaning of the word. And we did not capture that. Even if we train also our uh, world to vec to, we, I said we can train uh, the world to vec using lots of data on the internet, but we also use it uh, as um, we use also legal document to train our world to vec And uh, by doing this, um, we did not capture uh, the meaning of some words that are used in legal, but mostly more words that are used in common languages. And again, if you use this word for, for example, what we call natural language inference, so trying to know if based uh, according to an hypothesis, if the word, the sentence we have below, uh, is means the same or mean the opposite, that could bring some weakness. Uh, for example, if we have uh, the phrase here, uh, for successful investing, spread your money across different kind of investment. So if you have this phrase here, good investment are distributed across many classes, the posit we should output that those two phrases are almost uh, going in the same direction and this phrase is on the opposite direction. And here you see that one means that <coughs> that's it's the opposite direction, but uh, it's difficult for a machine to realize that this word has a really, really strong meaning. Uh, and those two phrases are quite saying the opposite. So here we have a little weakness uh, in the system and uh, we realize that based on the word, it's not very easy to, to have uh, some good interpretation of a phrase. So how it works, uh, we generally, we based as, as like I said, uh, we take the hypothesis, we extract a vector, and again, we have a, a learning function here and a classifier that try to infer if it's positive, neutral, or negative. And obviously, if the input is based on the vector, based themselves on what to vec, it's not, won't be very, very efficient. There are many ways to tune that, and uh, there are progress that has been done, but uh, so far it's, uh, it's, it's, okay. it's working, but uh, there are some limits. So recently, in 2018, so um, maybe a few months ago, a new paper has emerged, and uh, this is kind of new, let's say, um, revolution in the machine learning uh, space. It's uh, what, uh, called, what is called deep contextualized word representation. So here the idea is instead of having what, uh, what I presented you before, word to vec, uh, so word with vector represented, uh, extracted from um, the corpus of the data we, we injected and based on the window of the, let's say, few words before, few words after. Here we use what I presented you, uh, the LSTM, so we use a recurrent neural network to try to cat, capture here the meaning of this word according to previous words and give a vector representation here of this word based on the context. So it will change uh, the word, would not be run, uh, like I said previously, run will, will not be, we won't have only one vector for run word, for example, we will have a vector depending on the context. So this is really interesting because we can capture the word context and if we compare, for example, here we have the word play and the uh, word close to those, those uh, those words based on the word to vec is those one. But here, if you use uh, this, this method of Elmo, we can see that play here is uh, related to a sentence, to this word in this sentence. And we can see that there is a slightly different uh, meaning here compared to that one. And uh, it won't confuse between that word and that word. So here we see that play means someone playing uh, in the game. And here it's more the play, uh, the theater um, play. So it is, it's very, very interesting because we capture really the sense of the, of the word and we use now this as a vector, as an embedding for all our, our uh, NLP natural language processing uh, for all, as an input for all our processes. So it's very, very, very efficient, especially if you compare uh, what, they, what, the, what the paper produced, and we, we also uh, realized that it was very uh, efficient on our algorithm, especially on what we call the NER, not named entity recognition, we get a boost of 21%. But the drawback is that it's much slower because on one side we had vector directly from a word and it was just a, 
a table of uh, correspondence. So we have a word and we have directly the vector. Here we need to capture the word from the, the context uh, on using LSTM. So it's much slower, something like around 20 times slower. So that's the price to pay to have precision. Uh, okay, so today the, the CPU and the GPU are quite cheap and we can, we can, use, uh, we can use them, but uh, when we have to deal with thousands of documents, for example, you have clients sending us, uh, let's say, 100, uh, 100, no, no, 100, uh, 100,000 documents, and uh, they want it to be processed quite fast, this is, uh, this is kind of uh, difficult to, to use this algorithm in this case. Uh, but uh, we use it especially on uh, some specific tasks we know we want to have really good precision. So that's why uh, we won't apply them for, for example, word uh, document classification, uh, but uh, more, speci more, speci more specifically to word extraction for uh, name entity recognition. So what we do at Hyperlex so far, I, like I said, we were using all those algorithms, but we, use, we do uh, what we call supervised um, learning so we, we have documents coming from all our clients and we need to classify them we need to train the machine so we need, we have a, a team of of, um, of people tagging the document and we've spent around more than thousands of hours tagging document tagging paragraph tagging entity to just train the machine to train the machine to recognize an organization, but even more uh, precisely, not on only organization, we would say this this is not an organization, this, this is an investor, this is uh, the buyer, this is, so it's more precise, and we uh, also teach the machine to recognize hierarchy. Um, and we also teach the machine to recognize that a paragraph means something. So we have lots of, lots of, of, of uh, data that have been processed so far by our team, and it's, it's, uh, it's uh, getting more, we are getting more data every day. And also we ask for our, our client to um, go to the interface uh, we have developed and to validate stuff. So all our clients are also contributing to this, uh, to this uh, data set. We also use unsupervised um, <coughs> Uh, and supervised training uh, to boost a little bit uh, this stage. So for example, we use clusterization to just uh, categorize a huge amount of data in the same bag, and then if someone uh, labelizes this bag, we automatically uh, assume that the whole bag is uh, the same, so it goes faster. And we also use what we call local, local and global model. model. So for example, we have uh, the local model for one for each of our clients. Uh, we also have a local model for uh, each document. Uh, we have global model that is shared across all our customers. Sorry, uh, and um, we have some what we call arbitration algorithm to decide if we should use for, for example, a specific task, a global, local, or document specific model. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, so far, uh, the results are very, very good on document classification. I forget to mention, so when I say very good, it's not close to, it's close to 100%, and it's depend on the data set, so we need training uh, um, before, uh, it's not, if you have a client coming uh, with a new kind of document, we need to train the document and to have this, uh, this uh, quality. But uh, the results are very good. Uh, we, I forgot to mention that we not only doing uh, document classification based on word, but we also use what we call um, uh, 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 we <laughs> the optical or let's say image classification. So we take, for example, the few first pages and we uh, subsample and use a classifier. This works very well for, for example, for administrative forms. Uh, we don't need to have the words from the admin administrative forms, but we realize that, for example, they all have the same uh, same uh, uh, same. Uh, <laughs> uh, Layout, okay, sorry. Uh, so it's, it worked very well for those kind of documents and uh, it goes very fast. And for entity recognition and, and language inference, sometimes we are not uh, as good as we want, uh, especially if we want to have very specialized uh, entity recognition. Like I said, if you want to extract specifically, not the organization, but something more uh, precise, like uh, uh, the address of the headquarter, for example, or the uh, amount of the capital of the shareholder, something like that. So here we are able sometimes to extract very well the dependencies, but sometimes it's, it depends on what we need to do. So here, this is a, an image from our interface, and we present the stuff like that to our, our customers, and what they do generally is to validate that what has been uh, predicted is good, and it helps us to improve the, the, interface, the, the prediction for the next time. Just like when you do, when you tag your pictures on Facebook, uh, so you work for Facebook in order to help them to identify you better <laughs> on the next pictures. 
Okay, that's it. So uh, this is Hypolex and uh, that's it. Maybe first, uh, or there is a question already in the room. Okay, just before the question in the room, just a quick question to explain where you stand today with Hyperlex. So, um, in terms of uh, self development, self cycle, are you addressing specific industries, uh, specific type of enterprise, and uh, is your product ready today to be to be uh, to so be commercialized? Yes, yeah, yeah. So we have started the commercialization, and we have a few clients. Uh, uh, using our product right now, it's very interesting because uh, it brings a lot of uh, feedback, uh, not necessarily on machine learning, by the way. And uh, we have identified some uh, very, uh, some many kind of industry. One industry that is very interested by our our product is uh, um, how we say that the due diligence uh, business. So those guys are dealing with let's say uh, thousands on many more uh, documents, and they need to do it fast, and it's very uh, fast it used to do it. So. They inject us thousands of uh, documents and we give them feedback. We also have clients using our, our solution as an API, so we don't, they don't use even the, the, the interface. And we have clients, a uh, small company, when I say small company, it's uh, um, not that small, but uh, a company with legal uh, department who are having from five to 20 legal experts. And uh, they generally have more than uh, 100, from 100 to 1,100 uh, contracts uh, to manage. And here it brings a lot of value because it's really painful to to uh, um, extract and also to to re -re so re input I don't know uh, to re to get the, um, the the data from the document. So here it will bring a lot of values. And it's French, English, other languages. I oh, yes, forgot to mention. Yes, it's uh, language agnostic. Uh, but uh, every time we oh, English is very easy because, like I said, there are lots of unsupervised training based on the. On the, on the data you have on the internet, and they are training data set in English, that's very easy for English. But for when we don't have English, we, we need to uh, train with our team uh, to recognize some, some, uh, some, uh, some things we, we want to extract. And we work in every language, that's the beauty of the, of the thing. And we started with French, so this is very interesting because we decided not to go first in English because it's too easy, but to address the French with the limitation of French in order to be able to address every language. So we did also German and Spanish right, for, so, so far. Okay, you had a question. I had two questions. Uh, so first of all, thanks for the candid presentation and I appreciate the transparency of where you're at. The first question was exactly that, that like, how do you scale from, to a new language and you, do you have to retrain, I just said that. Mm -hmm. And the second one is the models, do you, like, I'm interested in how do you make them available? Is it through like a model store? Like what's, what's You mean technically? Yeah, or the business, um, like is, are you building a business around the models as well? No, I uh, we mean if you the sell global, the models. You have a local and global models? Uh, yeah. Are you selling models? Yeah. No, we are not selling model. We are selling through the API, but we I never <laughs> nobody asked us that. That's funny. <laughs> First but time. I, I guess it's yeah. your uh, secret sauce, no? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, we can. So uh, you probably don't want to sell them. No, I'm not sure we can also sell it. Yes, yes, and we, we there are models uh, uh, shared across customers. So <laughs> those models, for example, when we have a close of, uh, I think we said close in English, a close, no? Close, uh, what do you mean? La clause juridique. Uh, ah, la clause juridique. Uh, close, no? close, close, close. Yes. Okay. When you have a clause of uh, juridic jurisdiction, uh, it's kind of universal between all our, our customers. So that one could be easily identified and share. Or maybe, for example, clause of NDA, uh, like a uh, non-disclosure agreement. It's generally uh, the same across all the clients. But some clients have specific business, like uh, logistic. Um, uh, transport and uh, we have a client like that and it's very different from for example a client like Capgemini have a dealing with a subcontractor uh, contract so in this case there is really really no need to share stuff between them uh, on those specific case but on the global clauses uh, it makes a lot of sense. There's a question over there. Yes, hi, my name is Tone. I travel from Brussels, and my company is called Lex.be, and we do something very similar, and we're starting to encounter, and I think you will encounter the same thing as the legal professionals become more knowledgeable that they are training the algorithms, which are our models. Uh, they want to make sure that they, they all believe that what they do is unique and better than their competitors. And so they do not, they do not want you to share this feedback loop. And so my question, and you started answering it, 
some parts you use the feedback loop and use it apply it to everybody mm -hmm. but for some customers we now get questions that want to keep the feedback loop improvements just to themselves is this something that you're working on or integrating your in your uh, algorithms yourself yeah okay so you mean a uh, feedback loop meaning that they can improve the learnings uh, yeah so you, yeah. you're showing that your, yeah, yeah. your customer says yes this is good this is not yes, good yes, I validate yes. this we, and so you get the yeah, reinforcement okay. factors got it yes we, we have two kind of interface for that we have interface that is more for kind kind of quick and dirty but used by our our legal internal expert that are going to tag the stuff but it's very efficient it goes very fast it's just like instagram and you you, you tag stuff etc and we have a more um, clean interface uh, i show you a glimpse of a quick example here for our customers and they uh, tag generally if they want to have uh, something clean extracted from the document and they help us to validate but sometimes they don't want to do that and they just want to to trust the machine uh, it works for, for some clients it works pretty well but some of them probably uh, they don't want for example the notary they don't want to trust the machine though, so they pass across all the document and validate all the document to be sure that the data that we have output is correct so it depends on our customers thanks there was the first question there Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think related with what we are speaking is, for example, if one customer can can get benefits for the algorithm being trained with the information of another customer. Mm -hmm. I suppose you have a base, but I don't know if you can split that kind of information inside the algorithm. Ah, you mean uh, you want to segregate this, or you want to make? Uh, yeah, if you if you have a customer, let's say from the automotive indu industry, mm -hmm. so you will have some specific mm -hmm. language over yep, there, yep. but that may help, I don't know, a bank or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, is it possible to split yeah, okay, that information? Sure. Okay, yes, yes, this is done. Actually, actually, uh, we we do it, uh, but it's mostly human uh, fine tuning. So. We realize that in some industry there are uh, links between the contract and we, it's not automatically. So we said, for example, yes, in automotive industry they have this kind of contract and in uh, logistic transport they have this kind of contract. There are some similarities. Now we can share uh, these, these things. So what is very interesting is that we keep the contract from our customers and we, we change the, our algorithm and retrain, uh, retrain and re, re infer all the documents we already have and it's improving every day. So sometimes we do some fine tunings and we just test if it's the results are better on the training set and compared to what the client has already leveled. And if it's not good enough, we go back to what we had. So sometimes uh, having bridge between uh, one industry to another uh, could bring some benefit to the other one. And this is really what we want to do. So, And it's well understood by the client, by the customers because they realize that, uh, in fact, they don't really care about uh, that. Uh, what they want is result. They don't really care that someone uh, learned from another one. They just want their document to be better every day. So some of them say, oh, yeah, no, it's, I don't want. But we said that it's just like when you have a lawyer. Uh, when you have a lawyer, you, you learn from your contract. But if he's going to see another customer, he's going to learn also. Uh, he's going to apply what he has learned from uh, from uh, what from you I mean okay. okay there's the last question here I'm sorry because then after we're running out of time so last question but you going to Starix will be there after for the cocktail yeah, so. I'm, uh, I'm here for the cocktail hi my name is Pierre I'm from uh, UAVIA um, uh, one question which is a bit following what was said uh, do you um, preset the domain or the context of what you're looking for and does it mean that you have to prepare neural networks mm -hmm. depending on the uh, cooking legal, uh, traveling or so, or do you manage to get an open can be your system? Okay, uh, very good question and uh, very accurate in fact because uh, some industry, uh, we know for example anything related to real estate, we are very good at that and we don't, we set we set up some stuff at the beginning and now we don't need to, to for example train etc, a new contract, but when we have a new industry, we don't know really uh, how it works, we have to learn so there is always a stage of trying to understand what the what the customers want from the contract so there is always a setup stage uh, on the specific industries that also explain why on the business side we tries to we try to focus on industry we know pretty well at this stage because we are still small and then we'll go wider on uh, other industry but we don't close doors i mean it's if there is a new customer we will uh, study but yes there is a setup stage <coughs> even just to understand what the people want to us to extract and we did not decide to have a universal understanding at the beginning because it's too too painful. We are a startup, so we learn from our customers. So we, 
our model is going is going bigger every day based on what we have uh, as a customers. Okay, Alexi, thank you very much. Very interesting.